Welcome to Business Talk and uh, one of the concluding episodes of what has been a truly remarkable year. Who would have thought we would have started with the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and be ending it uh, with some geopolitical risk around who actually launched missiles into Poland? Was it, was it a mistake? As well as the FTX collapse and what's going on in the crypto universe. It certainly reminded me of a chapter that I read in The Age of Menace about uh, SPF, Sam Bankman Freed, or Sam Bankman Fraud, as he's now turned out to be. And he was hardly the self-styled philanthropist. He was making himself out to be huge red flags. And I've got one of the authors uh, who saw it all coming, David Buckham, CEO of uh, Monocle, with me. David, you saw it uh, in The End of Money, and then you ex- you really expanded on it in The Age of Menace. Has uh, this implosion in, in crypto land, um, so, well, I'm sure it hasn't taken you by surprise, uh, but it, it must feel somewhat satisfying to be able to say, well, we told you so. Yeah, I think... I, I try not to be one of those people who, who's, I, I, and I told you so kind of person, but I would say there is a degree of hubris uh, that that pervades my, my sense of the world. And I am glad in the sense, I'm not glad that people have lost money, but I am glad because for two reasons, it, the world starts to make more sense to me again, because it, it wasn't making sense. And also, I'm glad that the gambling native instinct, that kind of that native instinct where you get the, the kind of trading and everyone's opening a crypto shop and everyone's talking about crypto as if it's the solution to everything. I'm glad that, that, that the air has been taken out of that sale. There will still be the diehards who will say things like, you know, you can't gray list you know, Bitcoin, um, you know, there's no gray listing of Bitcoin and you still are going to have the irrationality of those people who've adopted positions like the banker mentality. But I, I am pleased that 2 trillion of the 3 trillion has been eliminated from, from, from this ridiculous market. And I would say I'm also pleased that people are seeing it for what it is. So so the, the you know Binance is an organization that's not well liked by the SEC, and they're the largest exchange, mm. and they were going to bail out, you know, the second largest exchange, which is FTX, and they're actually the cause of the failure of FTX, and inadvertently yeah. they shot themselves in the foot. So, yeah, the fraudsters are being you know like all Ponzi schemes, it's it's coming to an end. Yeah, um, and I think, thank thank heavens. Thank heavens, my, my heart does go out to all of the victims whose whose trust was betrayed mm, and savings mm, lost mm. and livelihoods destroyed here. But, mm. you know, it comes back to the point of these exchanges, what are they? they? They kind of marketed themselves as classical exchanges, but were behaving more like banks, you know, taking depositor <laughs> funds and then mm. making outside levered bets without the you know individuals mm. knowing this. So, again, it, you know, calls for regulation are only going to amplify, I reckon, into the, the new year. But let's come back to the age of menace. And you know, we've, <clears> we've discussed it a little bit in the past, but but really what inspired you at this stage in your career to write the age of menace? And you mentioned making a little bit more sense of the world. What, what are the ideas behind it? And what messages were you hoping to get across to the reader? I think, Michael, the main, the main message um, that, that we're trying to convey is that you can witness geopolitically a fracturing of, you could call it the Western narrative. You can you can witness the failure of democracy with your own eyes. You can see we're about to kick off the World Cup in Qatar, for example. You know where thousands of workers have died in in the awful heat, so that so that we could have the World Cup in Qatar, um, and you can witness all of this, but the main message that we're trying to get across in the Age of Menace is that there's a psychological dissonance, that there's a breakdown of a common story, of a single narrative, or something called the truth, or or anything that makes sense uh, as a single version of the truth uh, in the Western psyche, so that you can get outright lies being told by political leadership, outright lies, you know, where where CNN and Fox are at each other's throats. And that's just 
in the news, never mind the more, the more extreme versions. So the Age of Menace was written as, as a kind of plea to, to people who read it to, to think more carefully and more critically, albeit I, I, I take that it might sound arrogant, but I'm, I'm, it's a plea for people to think more critically about the positions that they adopt in their heads with respect to politics, with respect to issues such as culture, and, and with respect to, uh, you know, people have a tendency, Michael, to just, we call it cancel culture, just to stop listening. You know, la last year when I gave an interview on, on Daily Maverick, it was actually quite amusing in retrospect um, because um, Polly van Weyck actually conducted the interview. She's a fantastic yeah. Yeah. investigative journalist and i was it was a one hour interview and she had obviously really read the book and done the work and there were lots of people and they were posting messages on the on the side of you know on the, on the panel so i could yeah. see that they were responding positively until minute 46 when she asked about bitcoin and i gave my view that 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 i, I felt that, that it was kind of a waste of human endeavor and then I got turned on and I, I myself experienced this, this experience of being cancelled um, mm. where people were, were saying extremely rude things about me uh, because I held a view that was different to the one that they hold. So mm. we live in an age of menace, meaning that we live in an mm. age where our tolerance for any view that's different to, to the main view that we, that we ascribe to um is is just uh disrupted and yeah. for me i think we've reached the bottom i think we're climbing out of the hole like well, if you look got, at the midterm elections yeah you yeah. know i mean i, I was going to say though david and we can build on that now but you know what you what you're saying reminds me of what thomas Sowell, the the great american intellectual wrote about Around the time of the global financial crisis, there was always there, there was also you know in America there was the rise of this this culture of intolerance from the left uh, in mm. academic circles in high academia, uh, and you're talking mm. about you know Ivy League institutions, Harvard, Stanford, and other places where professors who held um, maybe slightly more conservative views of the world were being shut down in favor mm. of the so-called new kind of woke, all-inclusive narrative. Mm. And it, it mm. didn't allow for any robust debate, and that's really what academia is about. You should be able to debate issues mm. and, and not cancel each other out on the, on the altar of some greater uh, moralistic view of the world. And, mm. and that's certainly mm. a direction that, that we've gone in. But uh, why do you see us now clawing our way out of, out of the bottom? I mean, I think Twitter is a, a good example as well because Elon Musk has come in yeah. and he's also, yeah. a lot of people have, have now turned on, on Elon Musk. But what he's trying to do is infuse a bit more impartiality into the platform. Yeah, I, I think um, there's several things that make me feel very positive about the future and make me believe that we're actually clawing ourselves out of the the depths of purgatory of a kind of psychological sociological purgatory um and and the you know i could i, I can list them which is first of all the midterm elections in the u.s have been very positive in the sense that there hasn't been a red wave uh that was expected and um without uh, uh you know giving away my own political alignment I do think it's a good thing that there hasn't been a, a, a red wave. Um, and there's, there's evidence that Trump probably did more damage by campaigning than good for his own cause and for the Republicans in general. By, by coming out, he probably did damage to the Republicans. Um, there's also uh, the Liz Truss affair and the Kwasi Kwarteng affair. The sheer... And please excuse me for being so blunt. The sheer blinding stupidity of the mini budget that Kwasi Kwarteng put forward, in which the rich get taxed less and that they borrow for social programs, um, it's just insane. And it's really great 
that those two people lost their positions almost instantaneously, as it should be. And if you had told me three to four months ago that a free independent nation, Ukraine, would push back against the Russians without any real physical help, I mean, yes, a lot of weapons, but without, without even the best weapons, would push back and regain the capital of eastern Ukraine, which is Kherson. And if you had told me that, I would have been... I would have been amazed. And if you told me that the Financial Times and The Economist would heavily criticize Qatar um, for, for uh, their lack of human rights and Saudi Arabia, um, I would have been surprised. And if you told me that Joe Biden would be talking face to face with Xi, yeah. with, with Xi Jinping, you know, that's a really good thing. And this yeah. narrative, this nuclear tactical nuclear weapon strike narrative that we had a few months ago has also kind of disappeared from the, the global um, mm. media narrative. So I, I've got this, I've got the sense that people are, have also become less tolerant of intolerance and more frustrated with the extreme left-wing narrative and the extreme right-wing narrative. So for example, uh, definitely, people are tired of people are tired of the Kimberly Crenshaws of the world, and they're tired of the 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 kind of woke wokeism. But you also see people are tired of Sarah Palin, so yeah. she's done very poorly in the midterm elections. Yeah, and, um, and, and, and Donald this, Trump. To your earlier point, I mean, you, you could just see. The, I think what, a, what really stood out for me, American democracy took a, a, a step forward after taking several steps back, uh, particularly following mm. the storming of the Capitol, where mm. it was a strong rebuke mm. of the election deniers. And many of those were the, I don't know what you call them now, the McGaggers, because it's make America great and glorious. So he's added another GA yes. onto it. Uh, yes. But but the, but the problem is yes. he's still throwing his hat into the ring here, David. So it, it's not as if the risks have receded. You know, I had a very interesting conversation with a, uh, a friend of mine in California yesterday about this. And, you know, I think some people on the left feel very discouraged by the fact that Trump has thrown his hat into the ring. But I see this as actually a good thing. First of all, I would, I would argue that Biden can't run again. I mean, he can't legitimately yeah. run no. For a second term, I I I don't believe nothing against Biden, um, other his than age his age. Yeah, his age is against him, and the same really should hold true of Trump. Although he's looking pretty fit, but Trump, by throwing his hat into the ring, he's going to go directly against uh, the Florida governor DeSantis, and um, he probably lose in the primaries to DeSantis, um, and at least it will split the Republican vote making space for potentially a Democrat to win in 24, which is potentially a good thing for the world, which is an, an end of the Republican madness on the right and uh, also an end to the weakness of the left. So I know it sounds extremely high and mighty to say this, but I do believe that Trump's probably going to do more good than harm by running again to essentially split the Republican vote, um, if that makes sense. No, it does. No, no, it doesn't. I'm just thinking about that, uh, you know, uh, given what we saw in the midterms, that, that that's probably a fair assessment uh, because there has been a turn quite quite mm. clearly uh, and decisively within his own party against the kind of politics that uh, Donald Trump stood for. And back to mm. an earlier point, I was very, I was hugely encouraged by Xi Jinping and Joe Biden sitting together mm denouncing mm. nuclear threats um it had a mm. you know it almost feels like the cuban missile crisis all over again took us to the brink but then actually galvanized the world to go into a new mm. phase of um uh, de-escalation and anti-proliferation of nuclear weapons as well the, the the other kind of weapon of mass destruction i guess if you want to borrow from warren mm. buffett could be considered inflation at the moment and and that i think is one of the big questions you now next year I tended to, in the beginning of this year, think a lot of the inflation mm. we saw was a bullwhip 
following what what were the pandemic years and where they were you know the global economy was decimated so you were always going to mm. see a huge bounce back when when that mm. demand came back into the market the supply wasn't there because of supply chain issues and that would naturally lead to outsized inflation but it did to an extent mask what had been happening prior to the pandemic and that is all of the mm. central bank stimulus and intervention and i do think the media has missed and, and policymakers in large part have, have missed the role of central banks it's a big argument mm. that that you expand on can you just explain your your thesis around inflation because i think for investors and business leaders it's mm. such an important question to get right yes thank you michael for this particular question because this is one of the most frustrating questions because we're well, not questions as frustrating points is that people interpret the inflation problem to be purely a function of covid lockdowns and crackdowns and then supply shocks whereas that's not true at all mm -hmm. um this inflation has been fueled by an expanding fed balance sheet that went from roughly 800 billion dollars in 2005 to 9 trillion dollars by by 2022 um and there were a series of federal bank and ecb missteps that took place between the financial crisis which is where they started printing uh, vast sums of money like never before all the way through to you know e even including in 2019 pre covid they started a, a new round of printing money so there's there's a container which we call the world's economy and there's the dollar which is the the world's fiat reserve currency and there's 10 times more of it than there was 15 years ago oh. so how could there not be inflation mm -hmm. you know what i mean the fact that it got kicked off by you know uh, the invasion of you, you know of ukraine by russia is neither here nor there in my opinion um you know the rise the the, the ra rapid rise in the price of oil because of sanctions or joe biden saying that you know there will be a cost to putin's war on the american wallet the, these are all very disingenuous statements jerome powell knows what he did he knows what he did and he's now trying to undo it um and so do the rest of the reserve bank governors and so does the ecb they know what they've done um and if you look at if you look at bad policy gone wrong take turkey turkey is a member of nato their current inflation rate is 84% how can they sustain an 84% inflation rate so as a member of nato and as the only member of nato that's standing against finland becoming a member of nato and also the only member of nato that's allowing russian super yachts to dock in Turkey and thereby helping to evade uh, sanctions it's a inflation acts po policy bad policy bad monetary policy almost goes hand in hand with bad leadership and th this is an opportunity i think for erdogan to get it wrong to have probably social breakdown in turkey i would predict next year you can't sustain 84% inflation rate so a very long story short michael unfortunately with inflation in the us at 7.7% you know it's way out of range of the 2% to 4% range it's way out of range they've hiked several times i would agree that the fed can't just keep hiking i'm sorry for those who are deeply embedded in the equity markets the equity markets in my opinion still they haven't finished they've got another 20% to drop would be my prediction so they've had somewhat of a drop but they haven't had they're still running the average price earnings multiple is still running fairly high it's like 16 versus 15 to come down from you know very high levels the the tech stocks have taken a beating but still still there will be more pain I, i'm afraid to say in the markets and and, and what um, we've seen just on that on that point from an inflation perspective pre covid when everyone was saying well and and the fed included here they wanted to stoke some inflation and and you know their target was 2% and that they just mm. didn't quite get there and they were, everyone was worried about a japanese style 
last mm, mm, decade or two. Mm, and, mm, and the mm. argument was always put forward that inflation isn't um, isn't rising because we've got these deflationary forces in the world, things like technology efficiency, um, mm. the fact that you, you had China as the world's factory basically uh, using all of its labor to export deflation around the world by, by manufacturing goods at a price that no one else could compete with. What has changed for me, though, in that thesis, and I'd love to get your idea on this, is that there's almost been a pushback since COVID on, on uh, offshoring and globalization, and it's all about onshoring again. So let's bring all of that capacity, that that mm. risk, uh, in China back, but with that, we're going to we're going to see a reversal of those deflationary forces to an extent. So that that is why I'm also, along with the money printing, uh, wary of these structural changes that have been mm. ushered in through the pandemic and this pushback against globalization. What are your thoughts on that? So from from our research for the end of money, we're fairly sure that we're right about this. Uh, is that China is bankrupt as a country? They just won't say it. You know, they, they, their bank assets to GDP is 350%, whereas U.S. bank assets to GDP is 110%. So China's banks have lent 3.5 times their, their economic output, which is around about $50 trillion. We know that a lot of that lending went into property development. We also know that many of the property companies are bankrupt. We also know that there's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of unbuilt properties, which people have paid for. We also know that there's lots of empty cities. So China is roughly speaking bankrupt and will find it difficult to produce goods at a competitive price for the global economy. So the world's factory is out of business, in my opinion. And therefore, the so-called deflationary effect of China uh, is not true. This is, this is, by the way, aside from the fact that every year there are fewer Chinese workers than the year before yeah. because of the one-child policy. Yeah. So the amount of economic output that China needs to produce per person is outsized of anything ever achieved in history. Um, remember, um, if you have an investment fueled economy that's bankrupt, you can't fuel it with investment anymore. Yeah. So there's not, the, you know, there's, there's, so that would be my, the, my first point about the, the so called deflationary uh, effect of China. Um, the supply shocks that we experienced and the obviously zero COVID policy effect that still is sustained today, even. If you look at the Tesla factory uh, in China, is um, also reasons for for countries to find other ways to to get goods, yeah. and so the price of goods is going to pivot to to other locations, and I don't think it will be doing so at more competitive prices. It will be doing so at less competitive prices, uh, more out of more out of physical need. Um, we, you, you and I both know from, for example, is that, um, for example, I, I always make this joke about Don Julio tequila, um, you know, that my local bottle store, Norman Goodfellows, when you walk in um, and you ask for Don Julio, there's a sign which says only one bottle each. So if they have it, you're only allowed to buy one <laughs> bottle. So how that's, you know, if, if if in a in a in a price ga uh, gouging market, uh, Norman Goodfellows would just pri yeah. price it at triple the price. But they're not doing that. They're they're uh, pricing it at the correct price. There's just no supply. So if you multiply that problem by a thousand, so for example, beer bottles, for example, mm. um, and then on top of that, you put all of the restrictions that were put in place because of the climate change narrative. Um, I can't see how the supply side shocks aren't going to continue. Maybe yeah. they won't continue as badly, but they'll definitely continue. Um, I think yeah, I, I'm, I'm afraid to say that recession next year, more inflation. 
Yeah, and, and that point you raise, we have we barely touched on the climate issue, but the climate activism has upended the normal capital spending cycle in oil and gas. So where prices mm. would rise, you'd see capital flowing back into greenfields exploration, mm. reopening new wells, mm. and then prices would come down. You'd see that uh, then you know that lever would be pulled back, and so you'd have this carefully choreographed capital spending cycle that would generally keep energy prices in equilibrium. That has mm. been upended by climate change. So I, I also mm. agree with you on that point that that's going to remain a tailwind for inflation into well, well beyond next year because we've seen renewables mm. are, are just not cost competitive. Yes, they are directly, but for most mm. economies, you're going to have to have very expensive battery backups or pump storage schemes for when the sun isn't shining and the wind, wind isn't blowing. And when you add mm. those into the the levelized cost of electricity production renewables are still three, four times as much as what you've mm. used from, um, from coal mm. and uh, oil and gas. Now, we're we running out of time, David. Uh, <laughs> it always happens. Uh, having spent so mm, much time just unpacking mm. this steady erosion of democracy around the world, this um, mm. this this real exposure mm. of capitalism, almost a failure of, a ca- of capitalism, uh, capitalism that you've seen. But where do we go from here? Because, you know, we, we have to believe that uh, to your earlier points, we can and we are starting to pull ourselves back from the brink. Or do mm. you see this actually ending in something far more cynical and cataclysmic, a, a global conflict, for example? Where do we go from here? I, I, I am inordinately positive with recent developments. So people are very upset, for example, about the World Cup taking place in Qatar and the human rights abuses. People are genuinely... Um, Uh, crying out for democratic freedom in countries that are totalitarian regimes like Iran, where you've got people like brave Russians, uh, you know, uh, placing themselves in harm's way and disappearing, thousands of them, thousands of brave people in Iran and in Saudi Arabia and in in Russia um, fighting for democracy. And this red wave that didn't occur and the, the failure of the Turkish economy, um, I, I'm very hopeful that people, um, especially what, what really occurred to me was the reason for the surprise win in the midterms um, of the Senate was an uh, inordinate number of younger voters. So I, I, I would like to believe that young people don't want their freedoms taken away freedom of their their right to choose what happens to their body, freedom of movement. I I believe quite strongly that we've already hit the the democratic low and that we will see a rise of democracy again from from this Ukrainian conflict. Uh, The retaking of Kherson is a, a symbolic victory for all of us, in my opinion. Well, let's certainly hope that that is the turning point and the freedom of uh, uh, the, the world index actually starts showing a, a gain because it's been in decline mm. uh, when you measure democracy around the world mm. for the last 16 mm. years. It's all in mm. this. If you if you want to read about all of these themes and more tech billionaires, The Age of Menace with uh, David Buckham, CEO of Monocle, great to be chatting to you again and uh, look forward to catching up with you. You're off to London. Enjoy it, uh, Will. Uh, I'm sure I have a great breakfast in the the next couple of weeks. Take care. Thank you, Michael, so much. I really appreciate it.